Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's Ag in the Evening program. I am Shaniqua Davis, the Ag and Natural Resources Agent here in Gregg County, and I would like to recognize the other counties that have been involved in the planning and development of this program, uh, Houston County, as well as Tyler County. Tonight, we will have Mr. Daniel Duncan. He is a staff forester five with Texas A&M Agri-Life Forest Service, and Daniel will be talking about We'll be presenting over tree issues and care. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to be here to share this information with you. Uh, I wanna make sure that you understand that um, the section here on the PowerPoint that's gonna deal with tree diseases, that I am not a pathologist. And you can see it there at the, at the bottom of that screen there. Um, I'm admitting this right off the bat. I get in over my head pretty quickly with this. Some of it I've had direct contact with and, uh, uh, for several years. Some of it um, I really haven't, but I've been researching about it and um, particularly things like oak wilt. So let's get into this. And it's not advancing. My up and down arrows, nothing. So you did the up down, okay. Um, with the tree pathogen identification, what everybody needs to understand is that pathogens affecting leaves can be difficult to identify in the field due to the mimicking of biotic and abiotic factors that could be present. Once you want accurate results, you really need to send it into the lab to get this done. Pathogens that produce easily observed fruiting bodies, however, that attach to trees, tree trunks, or tree roots can be more readily identified in the field observations. So a lot of these I'm gonna be talking about um, do have some leaf impact only. Uh, and they're tough to deal with, but this first one is a, is a bad dude. This is Ganoderma. There are a lot of different types of Ganoderma. And once this is present on the tree, there's no way you're gonna be able to save the tree. But you, this, like several others, doesn't mean that you've gotta remove the tree immediately. So if you look at this, it does form conchs. It tends to form conchs at the base of the tree. I've seen it up to two feet away from the very base of the tree then at the base, and then as you look in the lower right corner, it can come up the tree trunk, usually not more than about six feet. It's pretty colorful. It's uh, very stiff. This is a fungal pathogen that's going to enter the root systems that have been damaged or severed, it's like during construction or cut and fill, or if you have wounding above ground roots, like when you hit the uh, above ground roots with the lawnmower, that's going to be a wound. You can get the Ganoderma at that point, as well as a variety of other things. Uh, this fungus lives in the soil as a saprophyte, but then it, once it develops, it's going to live on the dead organic matter, which is that dead wood. It does, the problem is it destroys the tree's structural root system or its anchorage. That'll compromise that tree's ability to keep standing up. Uh, to protect root systems, uh, to, to avoid this, you want to protect your root systems as much as possible. You want to do adequate watering. If you've got to do some, um, say like trenching, where you're going to be cutting through some roots, instead of tearing the root with the equipment, which you're probably going to do initially, come back with a uh, like loppers, hand pruners, and just make a smooth cut on the end of those roots. They're going to heal better and start regrowing a whole lot better. During the construction, if you can provide a cushion over the critical root zone, which is basically the base of the tree out to the drip line, and that cushion could be 12 inches of mulch, or it could be driving on, putting your equipment on um, four by eight sheets of plywood, three quarter inch thick. You just don't wanna compact that soil, which can restrict how much water the roots are oxygen and water that the roots are getting, and they could die from that. Once the root system is colonized with Ganoderma, there is no prevention. You can't back up and, and, uh, and start over again. 
So a lot of times people will, uh, arborists will excavate the soil at the root flare to inspect the extent of the structural root loss. Um, even when they do this and you know you've got Ganoderma, like I said earlier, you don't always have to immediately remove the tree unless there are other factors like limbs falling out, things like that. But once you see that conch, that is your visual reminder to be monitoring that tree. Several of you are probably very uh, familiar with the hypoxylin. Um, this really hit big time in 2011 here when we had the drought. Um, I've, I've seen it before the drought, I've seen it after the drought, but I saw it more frequently during the drought. This canker will go, when it's, when it's freshly infected the tree, it'll go from a, a, an olive drab green powder, which you can kind of see there in the upper left corner, to a brown powder and that uh, on the right side, you can see that powder on my fingertip. Then it goes to a tan, which there is no powder there. Eventually it goes to a gray, which you can see again back up in that upper left corner and that back tree trunk. And then eventually it goes to black, which is the lower left corner. That's when the, the spores are gonna be flying at that point. Even though it's like dry tar, um, that's when the, the spores are fly, fly when it's black. It's a very non-aggressive fungus. It becomes active when the tree is sufficiently stressed, which obviously in 2011, they all got majorly stressed. It blocks the downward flow of nutrients and water. That's how it kills the tree. These are windborne spores that are always present on the bark. All it needs is a, uh, a, a wound to enter the phloem, that downward conducting tissue, and that's when it can begin to infect the tree. This fungus develops underneath the bark on the wood surface, and then, the, like I said earlier, that goes from a drab green, olive uh, green, to brown, tan to gray, and black. The tree can live with this fungus for a long time, or it can die quickly if conditions are right. 2011, I heard of trees that uh, the, the crown completely browned out within two weeks. I had a tree in my backyard at that time, began to drop some limbs. I identified the hypoxylin on it, and I did not have to remove that tree until seven years later. Um, it began to drop enough limbs that it made me get worried, so I wanted to get rid of it. So the key here is to identify and reduce possibly eliminate the stressors that promote tree vigor. And that's gonna be true of a lot of uh, diseases and for insects as well. If you can identify what's stressing your trees, in that case, 2011, it was lack of water. I couldn't do anything about the excessive heat 24 hours a day, but uh, you can provide a little extra water, or in that case, a lot of extra water. Leaf blister. Probably a lot of you have already begun to see this. Uh, it affects a wide variety of uh, trees, but it does show up on oaks quite a bit. And it will show up as that blister right there and a deformation of the, the leaves. You can look at that leaf up in the upper left corner to the left side that's got the disease. The right side is a normal leaf. This is a fungal development that's favored by cool, wet springs, which are typically what we have in Texas. The problem is when it heats up and dries up, these uh, funguses continue working. So they don't need to be cool and wet uh, throughout their, their active season, but that's what they wanna start off with in the spring. The red oak group is more susceptible to the infection than the white oak group. Uh, the symptoms will appear early summer as a yellow, blister-like circular raised areas becoming reddish brown with age. Those merging blisters can cause leaves to do the curling. The spores are carried by wind and rain. They lodge under the bud scales and infect the emerging leaves in the following spring. The good news is if you can get past this and it's not a bad situation in your tree in the spring, the leaves do become more resistant to infection with maturity. Good news is there's no threat to the tree health 
once you get this leaf blister, but it can really make the tree look bad. Uh, products with the chlorophyllanol can be sprayed before bud swell for disease management, but this is only recommended in the special cases. And this is true when you're treating insects and other diseases too. When you think about it, if you've got to spray that tree and it's a big tree, you're gonna be spending a lot of money with that product flying all over the place. It may not hit the target that you want it to. Uh, we are getting more um, chemicals now that can be uh, injected into the tree, um, but that's, that has its own set of issues as well. One thing to remember with this one, this is a really pretty easy one to take care of. Do not use those leaves that have fallen to the ground for mulch or compost. You want to get rid of those leaves as quickly as you can. So as they're falling, um, and this will be true of any other leaves, um, we're going to be talking about um, bacterial leaf scorch will do this. You want to immediately get rid of those leaves, or not immediately, but very soon. If you're doing yard work once a week, rake that stuff up and get it out. Mistletoe is not a disease, but it is a primary concern for a lot of folks. Uh, if the mistletoe forms out on the outer tips, the smaller limbs, it's pretty easy to prune it out. But if you look at that the picture on the right, mistletoe is scattered throughout the tree itself on the tree trunk, the major limbs, the minor limbs, and the twigs. Once you get to that point, um, there's not a whole lot you can do because right now pruning is still they're coming after me now. Uh, pruning is still the best way of, of treating mistletoe. So let's get to the discussion on that. It's a hemiparasitic plant that absorbs water and nutrients from its host plant, in this case, the tree. Seed is spread by birds. The tree limb begins to die from that mistletoe point of attachment out toward the, the limb tip. The tree will eventually die because of loss of leaf surface with those limb tips dying out. Without that leaf surface, the tree cannot feed itself. Um, there's still a search going on for an effective chemical use. Some of you may have heard of Florel. Um, it doesn't always work. It's expensive. You've got to be up in the tree to spray this stuff. Um, with backpack sprayers and when it doesn't work sufficiently enough a lot of the arborists got to the point where they just didn't want to bill anybody with it anymore they got fed up with it and they're hoping that uh, research will come up with something better so for right now prune when practical obviously like that first picture of the trees on the right it wouldn't be practical to prune because by the time you cut it out you wouldn't have a, you'd have a tree trunk and that's about it because your goal in pruning is to drop back at least 12 inches from where that mistletoe is attached. You're dropping back toward the tree trunk. You don't want to get anal about this and just measure off 12 inches and, and cut it off right there. You want to back it up to another limb, even if it's a minor limb that's going in the direction that you want that tree crown to grow, that's where you want to prune it, right there. Okay, bacterial leaf scorch. If you will notice on this, and this doesn't show up on all leaves, all different types of trees, all cases, but particularly in that lower left corner, what normally happens is the leaves begin to scorch on the leaf margin or the edge of the leaf. So those elm leaves, the, almost the entire leaf margin is scorched. So if you look down about where the green touches the brown, you may be able to see a yellow line. Same thing on the oaks right above it there in that upper left. That's what's called a halo. That's one of the things that um, we look for on the bacterial leaf scorch. You don't really see those on the sycamore or the maple leaves uh, to the right. So it doesn't always show up, but that's one of the diagnostic tools that we're gonna be using in the field to try to determine what's going on and if it's bacterial leaf scorch. 
The Xylella fastidiosa is the bacterial pathogen. Tree hosts commonly are maple, dogwood, hackberry, sweet gum, white mulberry, American sycamore, a wide variety of oaks and American elm. I don't know why slippery elm's not in there, but um, could get on it as well. The symptoms are gonna vary by tree host, most often identified by the characteristic marginal leaf scorch. And then, like I said, that yellow and possibly a red band halo between the green and the scorched tissues. For oaks, the scorching appears on leaves of all ages at about the same time. Most, if not all those leaves on the affected branch will be scorched. And, and sometimes it only appears initially on a single branch. It doesn't affect, have to affect the entire crown at the same time. The sycamore and elm, the symptoms move from older to younger leaves. The leaves may curl and drop prematurely. There's no way you can heal a tree with this, just like the Ganoderma. Once it's in it, it's in it. Basically all we can do is try to make the tree as healthy as possible to keep it as long as we possibly can until it poses too much of a risk, safety risk, or uh, it just doesn't meet the aesthetic uh, design that you want for your landscape. So over time, those branches die and the tree does decline. So we, what, we're gonna do, what we wanna do is reduce that host stress. Again, we wanna look at the watering. Is it too much, is it too little? How much light is the tree getting? Is it getting enough? Uh, what about any chemicals or nutrient deficiency? Um, is it got, does, do we have compacted soil where the tree is not getting enough oxygen and water through the roots? If you can reduce all of those stresses, you're gonna increase tree, tree vigor and you're gonna keep that tree longer, even though it's got the leaf scorch. You can plant resistant hosts. Um, obviously that means you're gonna lose the tree that you got, but you can come back with different trees. You wanna remove the infected limbs. When you know that uh, there's, there's an issue going on, you wanna go ahead and remove them because that is additional inoculum if you leave it in place. And in that case, additional vectors like leafhopper type insects, the sharpshooters and spittle bugs to a lesser extent can come in, pierce those leaves, suck the juice out, and then they'll pierce leaves elsewhere in the tree or go to another tree and they can spread the infection that way, the bacteria that way. You can do an annual injection of the antibiotic oxytetracycline but it's only gonna provide temporary relief of symptoms. It's not effective on trees with advanced disease. Again, if you do that, you're gonna to have to really want that tree. Imidacloprid is being applied as a soil drench and injection. Uh, it's being tested to relieve the stress from those insect vectors. There is no cure for the disease, like I said earlier, but the trees can be treated to improve the living while they're living with the disease. Oak wilt. Now, to my knowledge, we don't have oak wilt in East Texas. And I've been hearing for years, oh, we don't have it here, we can't get it here. But after I went to an oak wilt training session, it's like, oh, yes, we can. This stuff affects, uh, affects any kind of oak anywhere in the world. And it's been around for a long time. Dr. David Apple at uh, Texas a University System has been studying this. Um, a long time. Um, I don't know how long he's, but that's what he's been doing ever since he came to Texas. And he's still working on that because he's working on other things too. Again, this affects all the oaks in the red oak group and the white oak group, and it actually affects them differently. Uh, the, the live oak is in the white oak group. That's that upper left corner. If they all look like that, when, when it has this oak wilt, it would be easy to identify. But when you look at that lower left corner and the upper right corner on those red oak species, uh, that lower left looks to be like a Schumard oak. That can mimic a lot of things. That can mimic drought. So it's, it's a little tough at times to figure out what's going on. The picture in the lower uh, right corner is a um, spore mat from the fungus and we're gonna get into some details about all of this here in the next 
four slides. It's caused by Ceratocystis fagacerum, which is a vascular wilt fungus. All species are susceptible. However, the white oak group does not seem to be as drastically affected. Um, the symptoms in the red oak family, you'll get this oily green appearance in the sections of the crown rapidly turning to a tan or a red color, heavy and rapid shedding of affected leaves. Tip, the tree will typically die within a few months of infection. The live oak will display that variety of foliar, a variety of foliar symptoms, but typically it displays that banal necrosis. That was that picture in the upper left corner. We have yellowing and browning of the lift leaf midrib and the side veins. The affected foliage usually drops off when the venal necrosis appears, but sometimes it'll remain, on, the leaves will remain on the tree. The tree will typically die within six months of infection, but some of them will linger for years. It most frequently spreads through root to root, root grafting contact among live oaks because they tend to grow in moths you'll have an island of several live oaks all together. And that's what you find throughout central Texas. Once you start losing those mots, which is a lot of your tree cover in that area, people begin to pay attention and know that there's a problem. You have less frequent root to root occurrence or root grafting among the red oak group. Overland, the spread occurs when the fungal spore mats, that was that picture in the lower right that I showed earlier, develop in the red oaks in contact and are contacted by insect vectors which carry the spores to fresh wounds that are 24 to 48 hours old on a nearby tree. So this is really interesting. This gets real picky here. Red oak group only, fresh wounds 24 to 48 hours. Um, the live oaks can also be affected in overland spread but again they're in the white oak group they don't get affected as much. The fungal mats will develop in the spring or the cooler times of the year. Only in the infected red oaks, in particular stage of decline, again, this gets real picky. It's viable for about two to three weeks and it has a fruity odor that attracts the beetles. For the suppression, you wanna promptly remove infected trees, chip, burn, or bury. If, you, if removal is not practical, you wanna remove the bark from the ground up to three feet on the red oaks to prevent the spore mat formation. Grind the stumps below soil surface in the urban areas. You do not wanna store, store infected wood, red oak firewood near healthy trees unless it's been seasoned for at least a year. And if you're gonna season it, got a lot of dead trees from oak wheel, you can season them, put them under clear plastic, bury those plastic edges of the plastic in the soil and that heat will kill the fungus. In the urban setting, they will use trenching down to four feet deep to sever that root connection, that graft I talked about. Once the uh, establishing the trench, this is kind of guesswork at this point because you gotta be at least 100 feet away from the closest symptomatic tree. So you're backing up working in trees that you would think that are perfectly healthy, but they don't show this, this oak wilt immediately. So they can be infected. Now, obviously in the urban setting, this can be difficult for the spacing and that depth because you've got all this stuff that's underground, water lines, telephone lines, irrigation, all that kind of stuff. In areas of known oak wilt, for pruning issues, you want to avoid pruning or wounding living tissue on all oaks, red oak and white oak group, generally from February 1 to June 31. That time frame can vary slightly depending on the location you are in the state. You want to immediately paint the cuts made due to the necessity in this time frame. If you've got to prune during that time frame, you want to put pruning paint on it. You want to paint the cuts or wounds any time of the year. If you're in areas of known oak wilt or you have no areas of known oak wilt up to three miles away from you. Remember this stuff is windborne and can be windborne and, and moved by insects. 
A thin layer of wound dressing or latex paint should be applied. You want to avoid thick tar paints. I'm going to talk about pruning paint a little bit later. You want to sterilize your pruning tools using a product like Lysol spray, which avoids tool rusting. 10% chlorine bleach and water wounds plant tissue and rusts tools. I'm going to get real specific about this as well um, in a little bit later. But Lysol was the first time I'd heard in 2014 that they're using on the equipment to do the trenching. Um, and those are done with big rock saws. I don't know if you've ever seen them or not, but they'll trench a little while and then they'll lift that rock saw out of the ground and they'll spray it down with uh, Lysol spray. So here's some of the um, methods of treatment in that lower picture, you can see the trenching. Uh, we may be doing uh, injection work uh, right now, propiconazole, uh, specifically one of the products, a specific product that I know of with propiconazole is Alamo. Um, there's different methods of injection. You can either do pressure injection like that on the right, or you can use the tree's natural um, function of drawing out that chemical out of those capsules in that Moje injection system. So the goal here is to inject the systemic fungicide, the propiconazole, into the root flares to suppress the symptoms. Now, make sure you understand that. We're only going to suppress symptoms, which are the visual appearance, in the effort to lengthen the useful life of the infected trees. Again, this is another one where cure is not attainable in infected trees. What we're going to try to do is make that tree, give it a chance to live a little bit longer provide some things that we want out of it. Injection is effective, is, is an infective prevention in the non-infected trees. We're not real sure how long the injection lasts though. That's the other equation to this problem. Um, non-infected trees that are uh, in injected now could eventually get the, uh, the oak wilt later. If you decide, decide to treat infected trees for whatever reason, uh, you want to pick those trees that have less than 30% of the canopy loss, they're going to be the best candidate for treatment. Again, you're not going to cure it, but you can potentially keep them around a little bit longer. Let's get to a, a friendly one here. Um, this is smooth patch. If you look at those pictures on the left, and that uh, bottom right, you'll see that above and below that lighter colored bark patch, the, the bark looks more deeply furrowed. Those ridges are, are a lot more material there. The furrows are deeper. But where that light color is, the bark is still intact, but it's a whole lot thinner. It's almost like somebody came along with a draw knife and just shaved it down, but it did not get down to wood. So the, the, uh, the vector is, you can see it in the upper right corner. It can show up that way, but it can also mature. We're gonna talk about, and it'll change as it matures, and we're gonna talk about that here in this next slide. So it is a fungus infection of the bark. It's commonly caused by the Aleridiscus oxii, and it decomposes that outer layer of the bark, leaving a smooth, depressed area. The fungus spreads by wind and water splashes during rain and overhead irrigations. It's gonna produce that flat disc-like structure that we saw in that upper right a while ago. Those are called basidia carps. It's on the bark. They're gonna be gray or beige in color, and they tend to curl at the edges. But they can grow together to form a larger body. I'm gonna show you a picture of this in a minute. It's commonly found on the white oak group. Periodically, it's found on birch, ash, willow, pecan, hickory, and sweet gum. The good news is there is no harmful effect to the tree health or the structure. Therefore, control is not recommended. Don't even try it. There is what I'm pretty sure is the um, smooth patch that has coalesced into a larger mass. It's not the individual basidia carps. Now you'll note that I've got on the 
at the top of the screen, the Perinia porio florophylla, however you pronounce it. Um, I seriously thought that that's what this was when I first took the picture. Well, I didn't know what it was when I first took the picture, but then I began to hear about it. Um, but the research that I've done on it, it says it's, it's only been showing up on live oak and that tree that it's on, that picture is on, it's, it's not a live oak. So both of these, the perineoporia and the um, smooth patch can look like this, look like dried paint stuck on the tree. The good news is this is not a bad one either. Uh, it's a fungus that causes that outer or decay of the outer bark on the bark rot. It's gonna show up on living trees, apparently only on the live oaks, it tends to show up on the larger limbs and the trunk, but it does not result in the smooth patches. So the basidious carps develop more or less flat against the bark in small units, but they can merge into a mass up to a meter long or wide. The research I did on that was documented there in the Diseases of Trees and Shrubs by Sinclair and Lyon. I did not find anywhere any kind of information on control, probably because just like the smooth patch, there's no real reason to try to do any control on this. So there's a lot of people who would gladly spray something on your trees for you thinking that they can control it, but you don't need to, to go that route. Save your money for something else. Tubacchia leaf spot. Some people may know it as a tenopelti. Um, if you take a look at it there in that upper left corner, that's the pretty much the initial stages. Eventually it can, uh, over time, it begins to look like that leaf over, over in the uh, right hand upper corner where those individual round spots merge together. That lower picture is just a uh, real uh, a good close-up of an individual spot. The spores overwinter on affected twigs and foliage. They move with the wind and the rain. Uh, tend to be more severe in the late summer and early far, fall than they tend also to be more prevalent during wet years. It often occurs on oak trees under various stresses such as nutritional deficiencies, particularly the iron. Spots start out as circular, dark brown to reddish brown in color, typically surrounded by a chlorotic yellow halo. The spots can grow together, forming those irregular blotches and severely infected leaves prematurely defoliate. So again, with this one, as they're dropping out of the tree, do not mulch them up. Don't put them in the compost. You want to bag them up and send them to the uh, landfill, or if you are, are able to do it legally, you can burn them. You, again, you want to determine the stress factors on the tree and correct it if possible. Obviously, if it's a nutritional def uh, deficiency, you can um, do some soil samples. So this is basically what you would need to do for fertilizing your lawn. Uh, so if you come up with these nutritional different deficiencies, it's gonna help all the plants in your lawn. Remember, fertilizing does not feed your tree. It gives the tree the nutrients it needs to suck it up into the leaves. Uh, the leaves are the kitchen. They'll photosynthesize and make the food that the tree needs at that point. But they do need the, um, those chemical elements for the nutrition. You also want to be careful of the proper watering. Uh, a lot of times if you have insufficient light, you're going to have different funguses grow on leaves anyway. Um, the possible pruning to increase air movement, you want to be careful with that. Um, I'm not going to say that that wouldn't work, but again, as you're pruning live material, you're removing leaves from the tree and that's what the tree needs to feed itself with. So you wanna be careful how much you remove. Again, you wanna collect, bag or burn those defoliated leaves. This is the bacterial wet wood and slime flux. 
Um, there, there's actually two different things going on here. Some of you may have noticed the, the dark stain, um, weeping stain like that that's shown on the right. Um, sometimes when the, if it's the tree has been there for a long time and this has affected it for a long time, portions of that dark stain may be almost a gray or white color. Um, sometimes it's gonna show up like the picture on the left. It's a little hard to see there, but there's three different really dark, um, dark spots that are bacterial wet wood. The sap is exposed to the outside of the bark. And at certain times, under certain conditions, there may be bubbles, like soap bubbles there, which is formed by the bacteria, which we're gonna discuss in a minute. But if you look really closely at that picture on the left, you will see a butterfly in the upper right, a cicada killer in about the midsection of that tree. Down in the lower middle portion, you'll see a red wasp. That sap is very sour, it's fermented, but these insects love it. So if you see insects all over the tree, you may have bacterial wet wood. So the wet wood occurs when wounding occurs in the roots and then it tends to move up into the trunks and the limbs. As the wood dies, it becomes water soaked that supports various anaero anaerobic bacteria, excuse me. Bacterial growth causes the fermentation, which is that sour aroma of the sap. And it also causes gas, primarily methane. When, when, they're, uh, um, when the bacteria is growing, it's gonna expend energy and that's gonna produce that gas. It also produces, uh, it's produced, I'm sorry, if I read this right, it would come out better. Gas that's produced by the bacteria growth creates pressure forcing sap to flow from the wounds or cracks in the bark. That's what allows it to come outside and start weeping so that we see that dark color. The flexing is a separate issue. It occurs from spring to fall, but primarily in the summer months. That exuded sap can be colonized by additional bacteria and fungi, producing a slimy brown mass called slime flux. So the information I got on that uh, was from a variety of places, but I documented it uh, there at the Davy Institute, that technical bulletin. Lichens. Definition of lichens. Any of various small plants composed of a particular fungus of a particular alga growing in an intimate symbiotic association and forming a dual plant, commonly adhering in colored patches or sponge-like branches to rock, wood, soil. That came from Webster's. Lichens pose no stress to plants, but the aesthetic appearance of the tree may be not quite desirable. So there's an example of lichens in that picture in the lower right. Uh, you have probably seen it before, different colors. I saw some that were yellow. I've seen some that were, I've only seen the orange once. Sometimes the, particularly the yellow looks like paint on the tree. This particular picture that's there shows a leafy structure. It's very three-dimensional in this case. Um, you could peel that off if you just really didn't like it. Um, but like I said, it, it poses no threat whatsoever to your trees. Let's get into pruning. Dead wood, dead limbs can be removed any time of the year with no stress to the tree. Okay, now hang with me on this next one. Good time to prune in Texas is mid-October through mid-June, but the best time is late fall to winter. Once you get on either end of those windows, mid-October or late June, you really better be, care, uh, be cognizant of what's going on. If we're in a dry, hot time, it would not be wise to be stressing the tree any further. Printing in those hottest months can add that additional stress to the trees. If it is necessary for you to do so, though, that pruning in the hottest months, try to get the watering to the tree approximately six to eight weeks ahead of time to better prepare it for that shock. 
think about it like you going in for surgery. You don't want to go in at your worst. You want to be as healthy as you possibly can. So you want to perk this tree up and get ready for the surgery that it's going to have. If oak wilt is in the area, like I said earlier, no pruning is advised from the start of February to the end of June when the fungus is more easily spread. Again, if you have to do it at that time, you want to apply the pruning paint. In the case of storms, which we have quite frequently, they never seem to pop up at the, at the best times, which there is no best time. So during a storm or after the storm, at the minimum, you want to prune to reduce further damage for those limbs that are broken but are still attached when the, after the storm has occurred. The reason for those targeted limbs is they can, if they're still attached, when they fall, they can tear more of the limb or tear into the tree trunk itself, exposing a bigger or creating a bigger wound and creating a more difficult situation to, uh, to treat later. Pruning tools. Everybody knows what chainsaws look like. Um, those are great for those large diameter limbs. But once that chain bites into that wood, it can be a little difficult to control where that, that saw is going. And we do want some precise surgical cuts at, uh, as our finishing cut. So you may end up with a pruning saw or a hand saw like that one pictured in the lower right. Um, that is really best for those super surgical cuts. The loppers uh, on the left are going to be taking on limbs anywhere from a half to two inch diameters. The hand pruners, again, the bypass style are best for, best for both loppers and hand pruners. Hand pruners are good for those small limbs up to a half inch diameter. Now, in all cases, when, you, when you're dealing with a cutting tool, the sharper it is, the better. Now, obviously that does make it more potentially dangerous as far as cutting you, but I can promise you, I've done this before. If you've got a dull chainsaw or a dull saw that you're working with, you're gonna be working harder to make it cut. You're gonna expend more energy, you're gonna get tired a lot quicker. And particularly with a chainsaw, you do not wanna be operating that thing when you're tired. It's just not worth the risk of injury. So make sure they're sharp. Okay, disinfecting tools. Um, this is some relatively new information that I've been studying up on, new for me anyway. Um, so let me get into it. The tools obviously should be cleaned of dirt, sap, and debris before the disinfection occurs, whatever you're using. That allows that solution, the disinfectant solution, to contact all of your contact surfaces on the tool. Wiping with the disinfectant is more effective than dipping. Soaking is the best, but it's also time consuming. So let's get to some products. Most of you have probably heard, and I've heard for, a, I don't know how long, many, many, many years, 10% chlorine bleach solution. It is true that the chlorine bleach is inexpensive, it's easy to find, but it's also true that it's very highly corrosive on your tools which means when you use this, you need to rinse it off after you go through the dip and dry it off to keep your tools at least somewhat in good condition. This is new to me. This solution over time is not very effective. It'll, it'll reduce down to about half of its effectiveness after two hours. Plus it requires a 30 minute soak to do really well. That was a shocker to me. I wasn't aware of that one. Um, and if you leave any bleach on your tool, when you make that next cut, you're gonna be damaging plant tissue. That's just the way the bleach is. The alcohol can be either ethanol or isopropyl, anywhere from a 70% to 100%. Um, used as a wipe or a dip on your tools is sufficient. You do not have to soak it, nor do you have to rinse it off when you wipe it or dip it. The alcohol is 
widely available, but you need to understand that it is flammable. So be careful with that. Although the alcohol seems to be a pretty good option here. Um, also, if you'll note at the top of the, the previous slide and this slide, these are the two uh, sites that I've got most of this information from. Um, Dr. Scott, Linda Scott, uh, I don't know if she's still at Washington State University or not as an extension horticulturist and associate professor. Uh, the other one came from the University of Florida Extension Service. They all, both sites referenced everything that I'm talking about here. So the household disinfectants, this one was a favorite of Dr. Scott. Um, the Lysol. She specifically said the original phenol-based material is least corrosive compared to Listerine, Lysol, and Pine Sol. Um, all of these are readily available. Uh, you want to apply them full strength spray or dip. The problem I've got with it now is that little research has been done regarding the effectiveness on plant pathogens. But if you remember what I go I said on oak wilt, 2014, when I went to that training, that's where they talked about using the Lysol on that rock saw, treating the oak wilt. So I don't know if there's any, been any uh, official studies to, to prove its effectiveness or not. Trisodium phosphates have been around a long time. They're very expensive, readily available, but they're also very corrosive on your tools. And if you get this on your skin, uh, my understanding it's a granular. And if that, if your skin gets wet, possibly due to perspiration, you can develop some chemical burns. There are industrial products, none of which I'm familiar with. Some of you may be that uh, quaternary ammonium compounds would include the green shield and clean grow. The hydrogen dioxides include zero tol, which stands for zero tolerance. Evidently, they've upgraded it as a 2.0 and the oxidate 2.0. Wound paint. Um, this has been a touchy subject for all, quite some time. In most cases, application of wound paint is not necessary as the tree reacts quickly, routing sap and hormones to the, to the wound sites developing a temporary shield to microbes, such as the bacteria and fungi. So as soon as the tree is wounded, it sends a message to everybody gather here, we've got a problem, we've got to keep the bacteria and fungi out. The next step that normally happens within a few weeks is that callus wood begins to form. You've probably all seen callus wood before, it's all uh, that rounded uh, wood that forms on the edge of the wound. Um, it can grow fairly quickly. Eventually, though, wound wood will take over, and wound wood is more like the, the typical wood throughout the rest of the tree. Callus wood is sort of a, um, is a precursor, basically, to the wound wood. Uh, if vectors are present, though, in pruning, um, insect vectors, disease vectors. If you know they're there, it's always advisable to apply the paint. Um, you're not gonna necessarily, well, I may have to modify that. In most cases, you're not going to hurt the tree using this paint. You may interfere with God's given a, a natural ability that God gave these trees to heal themselves. It can interfere with that. So of your choices, typically most people are probably associated with thinking about that black asphalt-based emulsion, um, which again was in 2014 at that oak wilt training, I was told, you know, to try to stay away from that. Um, you've probably all seen this and I apologize. I probably shouldn't have put tree coat in there. I'm not targeting them. Um, that paint works. There's no question about it. The biggest problem that most arborists are finding now compared, comparing that um, asphalt-based emulsion to the water-based latex primer and the water-based latex paint is that the, the latex 
gives a better seal. It's, it's, it's more flexible. So when that tree is moving in the wind, it doesn't crack at the edge of that seal as easily as it does on the asphalt-based paints. Okay, hopefully I didn't uh, get myself in trouble here. Like I said, tree coat, there's nothing wrong with it. Just understand what your limitations are with these products and what you want to work with. A new one to me is lac balsam. I purchased some a couple of years ago. I've used it a few times now. I'm really happy with it. It is a product from Germany, specifically designed for wound dressing and grafting. And you basically, it's in, it's in a tube, like a toothpaste tube. Um, and it's got a, when you pull the cap off, it's got a brush built into it. So you just squeeze this stuff out onto the brush and you smear it onto the wound. It's sort of a um, grayish green color, so it blends in pretty nicely with the bark. Okay, pruning, I didn't know of a different way of saying this, pruning applications. So let's just say when you're removing a large diameter or a long length limb, you wanna make these cuts. That first cut, A, is a partial cut from underneath. Cut up about into that diameter of that limb about one third. Remove your saw, put it a little bit further out on that limb away from the tree trunk and start cutting from above. Gravity is gonna pull that limb down and close that saw kerf there at A and then the limb falls off. Well, you're left with this stub. So you do remove the stub at, your, at that final cut C. So potentially on a big limb, you could be using a chainsaw to make cuts A and B, but when you get down to that surgical cut, you may very well need to be using a um, pruning saw, hand saw. Different things to keep in mind in pruning applications, you, you, do not want to remove more than 25 to 30 percent of the foliage in any given year. That will reduce the shock to the tree since it also reduces the trees in pruning. It reduces the tree's ability to feed itself. You do want to try to keep 50 to 60 percent of the tree total height in crown, up in limbs. A lot of you may have seen trees that have been pruned up uh, to give a whole lot more clearance and it looks like there's just a um, um, everything's concentrated at the very top of the tree. That is not a good situation when, particularly with hardwoods, pines can tolerate it better than hardwoods. But if um, sufficient wind hits that tree and it's only got limbs at the very top, it'll tend to put a lot of pressure down on the lower portion of the tree in the lower 10 feet and you could have breakage. You do want to prune for a structural form. You want to concentrate on, these are on shade trees. You want to concentrate on a central leader and you want to remove co-dominant branches. Co-dominant branches are limbs that are larger than one half the diameter of that bowl or the tree trunk and they're at an acute angle to the bowl. You may need to reduce limb length in stages if necessary to adhere to that first point above. If you've begun to remove close to that 25 to 30% and you know you've got to re remove a co-dominant branch and that's gonna remove more than that 25 to 30%, you may wanna remove that branch in stages. So you just pick a good location, lower down on that branch and cut off portion of it. That stage where you cut it off is just like the mistletoe. You wanna come drop down, look down at that limb, that's the problem area. Find another limb that can grow into that gap that you're gonna create and prune it there. The goal here is to keep as many leaves on the tree as possible so it doesn't have to go through an additional shock. Next year, you may remove another portion of that limb or maybe the entire limb at that point. You do not want to leave stubs, stubs and branch collars. What's the issue? Okay, on the left, that's a picture of a dead limb. Uh, the brown, the more brown portion, bigger diameter that attaches to the tree trunk is a living portion of that limb. 
You don't want to cut into that living portion at that point. You just want to cut the dead wood out right there where that hash, uh, that dashed line is at. The living branch on the right side, instead of just coming out off the tree trunk two or three inches and cutting it there and leaving a stub, the problem with that is you may get dead wood forming in there like you've got there on the left side, which can uh, uh, provide access for a disease and insect in there. If you will make a proper cut, leaving the branch collar, and if you notice, there's a little bit of swell there at the bottom of that branch on the right, and then it tapers down into the branch itself. Not all branches do this, but the more you look for the branch collar, the more comfortable you will get at picking that angle to, to cut and that distance to cut if the branch collar is not obvious. It's not a 45 degree angle, uh, but we wanna leave that branch collar there. Those are specialized cells that God designed for the tree that are going to speed up that callus wood production that we talked about earlier. And that will also speed up complete healing of the wound. Now, a lot of folks will start pruning right at the tree trunk and they will remove that branch collar. And if you look at that on the right side, if you can if you make a cut parallel, per, uh, parallel to the top of that tree trunk down to the bottom, you're gonna be creating a much larger diameter wound than when you left the branch collar. Plus the fact you're removing those specialized cells if you do that, you're gonna have a higher risk of that wound not healing if you do it that way. Patients, please unmute yourself. Um, All right, everybody or says in the hooray. Chat and we will be happy end. to help I want to do this fast um, and furious. Just so you know, we do have here. a new topic um, next week. It's um, hot topics on turf grass. To contact so me if later you're interested, we will be starting next week on Tuesday at 6 um, o'clock. I don't know if we've got anything. All right, well, I'm not seeing any not, questions but, um, coming in um, right now. So as you can see, um, I can answers, provide my email that. in the chat box as well as Daniel's is on the screen. So if you have any questions that you think about later, please feel free to contact us or email us and we will be happy to help you. I hope everybody has a good night and we will see you later.